Welcome back. President Trump will prohibit agencies, contractors, and the military from using money for certain diversity training. Officials at the State Department say they are prioritizing diversity and inclusion in the department's hiring practices. Terry Gertens, president and CEO of the National Academy of Public Administration. Terry, welcome back. Thanks very much for coming on. We have two issues at play here that both surround diversity and inclusion across government. And it's striking to me that we're talking about inclusion as an add-on to diversity because I think that's maybe only been within the last three, four years. A lot of emphasis on diversity in government for a long time. The inclusion piece is relatively new, isn't it? Well, it's it's different language, certainly. But we know um, that the more diverse and inclusive your workplace is, the better your outcomes are. And so corporations have been working on this for a long time, and the government's beginning to get on the same train. The State Department has had this problem for a long time. Uh, State Department officials talked about this at a hearing saying it's been since 1989 the Government Accountability Office has flagged this issue. What makes this hard for federal organizations, Terry? Well, I think, you know, the State Department, like many agencies, has lots of policies and programs in place. But the challenge is you can't just judge the outcome by the number of policies and programs. You have to really measure um, the statistics and, and the effect. And so clearly what the State Department is seeing is that while they're getting more diverse uh, hires on the front end, they don't have the retention and promotion policies in place to ensure that they get those diverse, that diverse population up to the senior ranks. And even their latest departure statistics show that their diverse employees are leaving the State Department at a much higher rate. So there's lots of processes that you have to put in place there to make sure that you're giving adequate training that you're deliberately making your selection and promotion panels themselves diverse, and that your leadership really practices and, and messages around diversity and inclusion. And sometimes, frankly, that includes providing um, training on equal opportunity and unconscious bias and some of the other things that, we, that we're seeing. One of the things that I have been struck by in the military over the last several months is the military has decided that it's going to remove names and photos from promotion board uh, exercises. Is that something that might make sense in a civilian organization too for better evaluation, for more objective evaluation of employee qualifications? Because one of the things you point out, State Department struggles not so much with bringing people in but with keeping them moving through the ranks and, and developing their careers. Well, I will say I'm not an expert in um, the diversity and inclusion practices specifically, but I am personally a beneficiary of some affirmative action, right, in terms of in women in the military. And so I think there's a balance between complete um, anonymity and intentional outreach and, and advancement. And sometimes you have to have some knowledge about the um, demographics of your client, of your candidates, in order to make sure that you're um, actually diversifying the population. So there, there's a trade-off between complete anonymity and actually making some intentional actions to add diversity to the workforce. Is it at least encouraging that, as the State Department officials testified at this hearing in the House, that the, the issue of whether a diverse and inclusive workforce is desirable seems to be a moot point? Everybody seems to agree now that that is the case, and, and we're talking about the way to get to that is that at least a win or is that not good enough, Terry? I think it's the beginning, but what I worry about is that many times um, diversity inclusion becomes an HR problem. And diversity inclusion can't just be an HR problem and it can't just be an HR program. It has to be the leaders of the organization, not that HR folks aren't part of the leadership, but it has to be the very most senior leaders at every level of the organization talking the talk and walking the walk. And you can't just pitch it over the fence and say to the HR folks that this is their problem. We just have about a minute left, and I mentioned the executive order at the beginning of our conversation, Terry. You mentioned something before we went on the air that, that struck me that I hadn't considered before, and that is this EO applies to a lot of organizations that don't have anything to do with the government on first glance, but have a lot to do with the government as you dig into it. Tell me more, Terry. Yeah, I, I think there are some um, administratively problematic issues to this EO in addition to some of the other concerns that folks have about it. When it says contractors, and you and I typically think of government service contractors, it is much broader than that because it goes to grantees. 
and agencies have to review all of their grant programs. That means that state agencies and nonprofit organizations who are delivering frontline government services are gonna be impacted. And it also means that universities who receive research grants are gonna be impacted. And so as these organizations who are already very deliberately working on diversity and inclusion in their client base and in their own workforce, review this executive order to the degree that they choose to opt out of future government contracts and grants because they don't want to meet these training limitations, we could see significant impact in serve, um, government service delivery and also in the scientific research agenda. Terry Gurton, thanks very much as always. Great to have you back on the program. Francis, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you.